following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everybody, welcome to another edition of Ion Oshkosh. I'm Cheryl Hans, and uh, I'm very pleased to be joined this evening by someone who's been a guest on our show many, many times, uh, local attorney George Curtis. Like I said, he's been here many times, and he was actually supposed to be here next month, and uh, the guest I had scheduled for tonight um, called with um, only about three hours' notice and said he was he'd come down very, very sick, and he just couldn't do it, and I called my buddy George, and he was gracious enough to say he could come in and do this. So here we are, and thank you so much again well, for saving my behind here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me, Cheryl. I think that uh, what you do uh, with the freedom of ideas and the free of speech is so important to the community. Keep it up. Oh, well, thank you. And you've got a couple shows of your own, and if we have time, we're going to plug those a little bit toward the end. Um, the guest, by the way, that we were going to have on tonight, um, all I did was I just switched the two guests around, so he will be here next month sometime. I believe it's the 19th of, of February. So anyway, thanks again. want to talk about, um, you know, we're just into the new year here, and every January, new laws that have been voted on in the previous session come on the books, and a lot of times we're not aware of what they are. So I uh, thought it would be nice to kind of talk to you a little bit about what new laws we have on the books now, starting in 2015, and the things that people need to be aware of about those laws, both state and federal. Um, well, so from as, Wisconsin's standpoint, as, what are we looking at? In Wisconsin, just like in Washington, D.C., the legislature didn't accomplish much of anything. A lot of arguing. <laughs> they just fought. <laughs> I have never seen such hostility and such unwillingness to uh, go across the aisle and work something out. My field, of course, is lawsuits, torts, representing people who are injured, representing consumers against manufacturers, uh, malpractice to the degree that it's still left in the state of Wisconsin, and very little was accomplished. There was a an attempt to uh, erase the collateral source rule that failed. The collateral source rule is a rule that uh, many people aren't aware of, but it basically says that uh, if you're a consumer, you're injured, and you have uh, health insurance or first party coverage on your med pay in a car, and your doctor accepts less than full retail because your first party coverage doesn't pay full retail. Only people without insurance pay full retail, you know that. Yes. <laughs> uh, that you still have a right to go against the guilty party that caused the accident for the fair market value of those services, even though it's full retail. The uh, Republicans have been trying to get rid of that rule for more than 40 years. It's a, a rule that benefits consumers, sure. and uh, they tried again last session, and they'll try next session. However, they did pass one anti-consumer law. It's called the I'm Sorry Law. It mm. relates to medical malpractice, and basically what they passed is in the event that somebody is killed or crippled through medical negligence, 
and the doctor admits that he or she cut off the wrong leg or hit the wrong nerve or gave a shot of the wrong medicine, that cannot be used as evidence. It's different than, in, for example, if you were a, a, in an automobile accident and you say, I'm sorry, I didn't see the stop sign, that's major evidence. That's an exception to the hearsay rule mm -hmm. uh, that can be used against you. That's been the best evidence there is for 500 years, sure. but not if you're a doctor in Wisconsin. So why, why did they pass that then? I mean, obviously, you know, physicians probably have a, a big lobbying association uh, and, the, and they've got deep pockets. But, you know, how does that, how do lawmakers, George, think that that is benefiting anyone except those who have money? Well, of course, they don't. I'm afraid that you put your finger on it. It's follow the money. Mm -hmm. Both major political parties, and now I think there's a third, uh, are basically money interested partisans, and uh, there are no saints among them. Uh, we we find that uh, typically the Democrats are pro labor, pro consumer. Uh, pro-teacher, pro-school, pro-environment, and they get support from all of those groups. Mm -hmm. It's not just the kindness of their heart. Uh, we find that traditionally the Republicans are more likely to be pro-insurance, pro-professionals, uh, pro-manufacturers, and uh, certainly pro the medical profession. Now the third party is uh, the one that's going to keep us up at night doing our homework and, <laughs> and uh, it, some days it dances with the Republicans but other <laughs> days not. <laughs> that's, that's the Tea Party. But it's all a case of following the money. Mm. There are no saints. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, the Republicans are in essence, just as everybody I think probably knows, and some would agree with us, they're buying their election. You know, they're buying their candidates with their huge donations and their, you know, gargantuan and very rich lobbying organizations, oh, uh, powerful. I, the, abs absolutely. And of course, the um, Citizens United decision by the United States Supreme Court says that corporations are people and that's free speech, and mm -hmm. they can spend unlimited yeah. amount of untraced money to buy elections. But I had that discussion with Greg Underheim on my own show last week. Greg's point, and it is the point of view of most Republicans, is that uh, that's a part of democracy. Uh, corporations, businesses, dollars are voters. And... <laughs> You know, you just pick your poison. How I don't even know how Greg can justify that. How is a corporation a voter? They're not a registered voter. The corporation does not go to the ballot box, um, except with its dollars. <laughs> you well, know. Well, you have the same bias I have. Yeah. I, my bias is that we have become a big moneyed corporation as a nation. Mm -hmm. And the individual rights and powers have been eroded something terribly. In fact, I think the only two that the people have left is the right to the vote, the ballot box, and the right to a jury trial, the jury box. And both of those are being intensely eroded to make it more difficult for people to vote for people to have a free jury trial mm -hmm. uh, judged by their peers. I, I think that, frankly, the country's at crisis. If you believe that this is a, a nation of individuals instead of a, a, a nation of corporate dollars. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to go back to this I'm sorry law. So does it only apply then, George, to cases where someone has been either killed or severely um, handicapped, if you will, or severely injured, or could it apply, would it apply in any situation? It applies to all medical malpractice. Okay. But you put your finger on something that people should know. There are more moose sightings in Wisconsin 
than successful malpractice cases because of a number of things that have happened in the legislature and the philosophy of the conservative people in this state mm -hmm. so that there are very few successful med mal cases. Big law firms that advertised for them 15 years ago won't even look at one now. Mm -hmm. They are so incredibly expensive. You need experts in that all of the doctors really are insured by the same patient's compensation uh, fund here in the state of Wisconsin. And you might recall that uh, our governor, uh, Do Doyle, uh, kept uh, trying to borrow that money because mm -hmm. there was so much money there, they weren't paying off claims. Uh, so that medical malpractice is uh, an endangered uh, k kind of a case. Uh, doctors are practically immune and hospitals are practically immune. The law has been strengthened from their point of view. Uh, we have, uh, I think it's only Wyoming has fewer med mal cases than Wisconsin and Wyoming has more horses than people. Uh, <laughs> so that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying we have bad doctors. I think we have good doctors, but they, mm -hmm. they, they make mistakes. Sure. And, uh, they're pretty much immune from having to pay the piper. And uh, it all goes back to insurance companies. This isn't do about doctors, this is about insurance. So, I mean, do you see in your practice a fair amount of medical malpractice suits or not so many? You no, know, I think that uh, it would be unusual if we had more than one med mal case go to trial in Winnebago County in a year. Hmm. A friend of mine tried one just a matter of a couple of weeks ago. And uh, the uh, doctor did and conceded he took out the wrong organ. The result was a hung jury. The jury could not agree that that was malpractice. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm speechless over that one. I really am. I, I don't know where that jury's head was at. Well, frankly, I didn't see the evidence, and so I want to stand up for the jury uh, because I believe in juries. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's it's a kind of a conservative set and a protective uh, veil uh, that really protects the doctors. I mean, y y if this was an auto accident case, I don't think it would have taken the jury very long. Yeah. So, so they were saying with their verdict, eh, he made a mistake, but does that rise to the level of malpractice? Well, I don't know what they were saying. I wasn't in the jury room, but basically uh, my friend who was trying the case for the alleged victim had to persuade 10 of the 12 people mm -hmm. to decide that this was malpractice. Now, keep in mind, the law in the state of Wisconsin is that a bad result isn't evidence of malpractice. Mm -hmm. And certainly there are risks whenever you go to a mechanic. There are risks sure. if you go to a doctor or a dentist. And uh, uh, not everything is going to go right when people start being cut on. Sure, that's true. Um, what other laws, I realize you said that there weren't too many, but uh, is there anything else on a state level that people need to be aware of? Well, certainly. Uh, first of all, there isn't a lot happening in the tort field, the consumer mm -hmm. right to go to court and win your case against an insurance company, a manufacturer of a bad product, or, or things like that, because they've pretty well done it to us here in the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. They have set back the tort law by at least 30 or 40 years. Uh, but of course, they're still trying to do some of that. One of the bits of legislation that's in the mill is to weaken our workers' comp law. Wisconsin was a leader in workers' comp and uh, was copied by many other states it isn't a big payout. If you've ever had workers' comp, you get about two-thirds of your salary while right. you're unable to work. But um, it was a law that really helped people where the bread earner was injured and was not able to support his or her family. It kept them going until he could heal and get back on the job. Sure. That There's legislation right now to emasculate that. Now, 
that's pro-employer mm -hmm. legislation. We have to keep in mind that we have a Republican governor and we have a Republican legislature, both houses, and so it won't, it won't be difficult for them to force that through. Now, what's wrong with that? If you are Governor Walker and you're open for business and you think that the, the most important thing is to have more successful manufacturing companies coming into the state, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'll, I give Governor Walker credit. Uh, first of all, uh, he's won two or three elections and uh, he's got some leadership ability. He's persuaded people that his goals are their goals. Now, what really happens if, if this workers' comp is weakened and so that now it's going to be harder to get on workers' comp if you're injured? Well, then it's going to go on the welfare system. Medicaid is going to end up having to pay the tab that workers' comp used to pay, mm -hmm. and that means the taxpayers. So what this really means is what when you reform something, it means you're taking something from one group and giving it to another. And in this case, yeah. if that legislation goes through, uh, we're taking some powers away from workers and we're giving it to the employers. And uh, who pays in the end run? The, the taxpayers, because sure. those folks got to eat and those folks got to go see the doctor. Mm -hmm. Well, and at what point does Medicaid just say, you know, I, that happened with Badger Care a few years ago. They said no one can get on it anymore at this point. You know, they've got a long waiting list, but no one can get on. So at what point is the same thing going to happen with Medicaid, which Badger Care is a form of Medicaid? Um, you know? We may be close to that point. Hmm. Uh, and that's, what, that's why it's important that everyone be aware of the issues, follow the money, and decide, can we balance something out that's fair to both sides? Well, recently in Wisconsin and in Washington, both sides haven't been talking. Right. And so uh, there hasn't been much balancing going on. Right. So how badly will this dissemin disseminate, not disseminate, <laughs> Just how badly will this tear apart the the current workers' compensation system and the the benefits that a worker gets? Well, again, decimate. There's the word I was looking yeah, for. Yeah, there 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 are two plans that I'm aware of, and uh, depends on how much they weaken it. Uh, some of the weakening is to reduce the number of judges. Uh, to, take away day judges, to make it so that people have to hire a lawyer. That's a hump in itself. You know, many people don't feel that they can afford to hire a lawyer. They're afraid of the legal costs. Mm -hmm. Under the present system, the legal costs really are a bargain because the statute says the lawyer gets 20% of the amount in controversy. So the lawyer uh, really doesn't get a lot of money, and, sec right. and secondly, if there's nothing in controversy, the lawyer doesn't get anything for advising the client and saying, look, you're doing all right, they're paying what they should. So that uh, the whole idea is to weaken the system, mm -hmm. make it less expensive, cut back the number of people who are there working for the consumers, and benefit manufacturers or employers. You know, one of the I think one of the goals, one of the supposed goals of some of these laws was to um, make it so that our court system, system wasn't so heavily burdened and, and taxed. Do you see that though? I mean, you're in the courthouse probably five, six days a week. Um, you know, do you see that there's less lawsuits being filed? Oh, there's no question about it. Uh, litigation has gotten so expensive that um, we have many fewer lawsuits than we did five years ago. And we have fewer five years ago than we did 10 years ago. <laughs> when I first came to this town and tried cases, I would say that there were more than a dozen very competent courtroom lawyers. And um, they were trying personal injury cases and other cases to juries regularly. Now a jury trial is a rarity.
There are many reasons for that. One of the reasons is the expense of medical records, which have uh, gone up 10 yeah. times. Yeah. Another is the expense of getting a doctor to testify. When I started doing this, a doctor thought it was his or her responsibility to go to court and stick up for their patient. Not anymore. The last two bills I got from doctors were five grand cash in advance, no checks or IOUs, or yeah. I'm not coming. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's changed a lot. It's, uh, you take the small case, a case that's under $25,000, you can win that case and your client go in the hole when you figure they have to pay back the, uh, the, the, the medical expenses. They have to pay back the subrogation to the first party carriers that paid some of the bills. Mm -hmm. They have to uh, pay the lawyer and they have to pay the medical witnesses that come. Uh, you can try a fifteen, twenty thousand dollar $20,000 case and everybody loses money. Sure. Uh, it's, a, it's a system that has brought forth a partial solution and that's uh, ADR, alternate dispute resolution, mediation, arbitration, referees, and that's helped a little bit with the smaller cases. Yeah. I, I referenced sometimes six days a week being in the courthouse. Um, you know, when I was a reporter, every once in a while I'd be covering a case that they went into, you know, uh, they continued the trial on a Saturday. Sure. Do you still see a lot of that or not so much? We see less and less jury work. Uh, Period. And uh, yeah. uh, because of the ex expense of litigation mm -hmm. and because uh, there are powers that be, money powers that don't trust juries. They don't think juries are smart enough to decide their cases. It's interesting. They think juries are smart enough to try a murder case <laughs> where somebody in some states would be put to death. <laughs> Yeah. in this state, life imprisonment, but they don't think they're smart enough to figure out a product that failed. Well, you know, while we're on the subject of juries, I mean, I've served on, um, I think, maybe three juries in, in my lifetime, um, once here and twice in other states where I've lived. And I am, I'm kind of embarrassed or ashamed to say that I'm losing a little bit of respect, not completely, but I am losing some respect for juries just in general. You know, when when we see some of the cases that have made national headlines and the jury goes the way they go, or a grand jury, which is really made up of nothing more than ordinary citizens as well. You know, we, we've seen in recent months how some of those grand jury things have gone too. And I, I just look at that and I say, you know, I, I want to respect the jury because they were there. But when you're watching the same evidence on television, you know, gavel to gavel coverage, and you just sit back and you say, how did they arrive at that decision? <laughs> you know? Well, well that's a couple of good questions. First of all, grand juries in many instances are really political picks like a coroner's jury or something like mm -hmm. that. And so sometimes the sheriff gets to pick pretty much he knows which way they're going to bend. Uh, secondly, the tidbits we get on television probably aren't a clear picture of what the jury actually did hear. I don't want us to lose confidence in the jury system because wherever they don't have the jury system, it gets corrupt mm -hmm. in a hurry. Now I will concede that juries, just like the rest of the people, are a little more impatient today, a little less willing to sit through a, a trial of a week or two weeks. It's quite a sacrifice. So now we have to present the testimony to them in a hurry mm. or they're not really uh, going to be paying attention. Also, they're, they're people, they're human beings, and they're sometimes sitting and thinking about their own problems. And so I find in these tough times that we don't do as well with juries as we do in good times. And that's just human nature. They might be thinking about the fact that their own partner or spouse is unemployed or homesick or going mm -hmm. to have a surgery. And uh, 
the little bit we pay jurors uh, doesn't take their mind off it. So that uh, I think we have to respect the jury system, don't give up the jury system, keep improving the jury system, and pay people so they are not losing a pile of money. Yeah, and, and that's true. I, I mean, some employers, uh, they will continue to pay you, and then you give them the check that you get right. from the county. But if that's not the situation for someone, what do they get paid now these days? I, th I think that I talked to a juror. It was in another community, but it was 26 bucks a day. Uh, that's Plus a, mileage. Let's yeah, not forget the yeah, mileage okay, part of it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> which you'd have to drive in from outer space or fly in from outer space right. to make so it worth your while. It's a sacrifice. It's a duty. Most people who have served on juries believe in the jury system. I don't always agree. Uh, it's awfully hard sometimes to get a jury of your peers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, are there miscarriages of justice? Of course. But is there another system that comes close? No. Okay. Um, any other laws that we need to talk about here before we talk about some of the other interesting things that you and I were chatting about before we started rolling? Well, I think that um, there's going to be a big issue about uh, the right to work. Mm. Uh, the, um, uh, the flavor from the governor's mansion has changed. Uh, governor Walker came in with blazing certainty and knocked all the pins in the bowling alley down, uh, took some very, very strong positions, rammed them through, uh, took no prisoners, didn't care who, who went to Illinois and who stayed there. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> now he seems to be testing the water for the White House, and so he's not so interested in causing a big fight over some of the sensitive issues, uh, and one would be the right to work and union rights. Uh, another would be school vouchers. Remember that uh, uh, his party uh, was very interested in expanding the school vouchers, which the people uh, in the more liberal camp said is just taking money away from public education and feeding it to private education. Those issues are going to be big issues because not everybody in Governor Walker's party are listening to him. Yeah. You know, I just, um, this afternoon, and I didn't even have time to read the story, but I saw a headline, and I believe it was in the Post Crescent, um, where he's trying to do something now with the tuition for technical colleges. Are you familiar with that at all? I, I only saw the same thing that you did, okay. but um, uh, education is a major issue. How we're going to educate people who don't have means, the, the family where uh, this is the first generation that will have a shot at college. College is getting so incredibly expensive. Yep. People are coming out of college with three, four hundred thousand dollars in school debt. They can't ever fathom being able to pay it back. Sure. And so there's some real issues about providing uh, somewhat close to equal opportunity, even though it's a myth. I mean, if your family has money, uh, you're, you're going to be able to find a school that will take your money. Sure. When you were on, um, I believe it was the last time, maybe two times before, one of the laws that you had told Dan and I about when, when Dan was still co-hosting with me had to do with our loved ones in nursing homes um, and how that was really badly weakened to the point of being able to um, find out information about them, um, being able to come to their defense if there was an issue of some kind of uh, neglect or whatever. Um, have we made any headway in improving that situation? No. That law, I think, was two years ago. Okay. And um, uh, basically the law is that even though if there is an injury or a death, an accident in a nursing home or a residence home, there are certain state and federal reports that are required to be made. Nobody 
is allowed to testify or give evidence, somebody who works there, uh, who saw it, who maybe did it, not just in a civil case where we might be suing for damages because of injuries to grandma who was dropped or given the wrong medicine, but even to the district attorney. <laughs> the district attorney cannot compel that testimony. That's still the law. We haven't been able to fix it. Is that a state law, George, that's or is that a federal? That's a state state of Wisconsin. That's, okay. That's part of the, the Walker tort revolution. See, it's just ridiculous because, I mean, I would be so enraged, as I think anyone would be, if something happened to a loved one in one of these facilities. And how are you supposed to do anything to recompense yourself or your loved one for wrongs that have been committed against them? They're the most vulnerable people in the world. Yeah. They're elderly, they're fragile, they often have dementia. They cannot uh, uh, testify themselves effectively as to what went on and they, they sometimes are, get injured, sometimes they're dropped. So, you know, hip fractures are pretty common and uh, sometimes they get the wrong medicine, sometimes they get tangled up in the bed and get strangled. Uh, they, the, the list of tragedies goes on, and in Wisconsin, uh, basically, you can't use the evidence even if it's there. So, all right, let's 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 just take a, a situation here. Um, Grandma falls, um, not of her own, someone is there with her, but sure. they don't have a good hold on her. She falls. Uh, they have to fill out all these reports. You can't really sue them because nobody can be compelled to testify. <laughs> so will, the, will these people, I mean, who do these reports go to? Do they go to There's, OSHA or uh, where uh, do they go uh, to? Well, a uh, different agency, but uh, both, uh, in most instances, both state and federal reports have to be made. Mm -hmm. uh, we demand those reports uh, with great difficulty. We get them with a lot of things blotted out. Uh, but uh, when it comes to who we can call as a witness, the two people who should have used a Hoyer lift to lift Grandma and didn't can't be, they can't testify. Even and if they wanted to, they can't testify. You said things are blotted out. Why are they redacting information? I am not sure, but we, we use the Freedom of Information Act and we, we sure. use whatever resources we have and we keep trying. It sometimes takes us a half dozen tries and we know we never get everything. Hmm. So in cases like that, George, are you seeing them being compelled by their insurer or these agencies that oversee them to make a settlement offer to the family or is that falling by the wayside too? Well, there are very few settlement offers because an insurance company is a business and yeah. they're not going to offer money unless they think they're going to lose. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. It's just getting worse and worse. I'm so glad you came on. Well, frankly, <laughs> uh, these things go in kind of pendulums and the last almost a decade in Wisconsin, the pendulum has been swinging against ordinary citizens against consumers, against victims, and in favor of corporations, insurance companies, big business, uh, against labor and in favor of business. And there are many people, honorable people, who say that's good. Mm -hmm. That um, you trial lawyers that represent consumers and victims are just really uh, impediments to progress and we have to stop that so we make Wisconsin more friendly to business and we have more people who will come here and start companies and that means more jobs and uh, you're hurting the people you think you're helping by trying to protect them. Unfortunately, I don't agree with that. I think that uh, we have a uh, so-called middle class, and I don't believe in class, that is struggling. They're the ones that are paying a disproportionate amount of the taxes, having a difficult time supporting their families, often having two or three jobs, almost always both adults having to work. And uh, 
often having the kids at uh, nursery schools be, and no parents at home, I think they're the ones that are having the toughest time right now. Sure. And of course, that was part of uh, President Obama's State of the Union. Mm -hmm. He said, these people are being screwed and we're going to do a better job for them. But of course, he doesn't have the Congress. I don't, yeah. I don't know how he's going to do it. No, <laughs> I, I don't know either. You're right. Um, mm. I, I know that other laws that are pending in, in individual states across the nation um, are ag-gag laws. And for anyone who's not aware of what that is, you know, there are humane associations that go into um, farming situations where they're maybe producing meat or whatever the case may be. And they do undercover investigation and shoot video of just horrible atrocities that are being committed against these animals. I, I mean, uh, jamming them, kicking them, you know, smashing their heads with certain things, it, 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 and it's just disgusting. So there are laws pending in a lot of states right now, and they're called ag-gag, and they're trying to outlaw, basically, organizations like the National Humane Society for the U.S. and, and others from going in undercover and shooting these videos. Um, you know, I, I think that the HSUS is doing everything it can to get these things so that these laws are not put through. Um, do you know if there's anything being done currently in Wisconsin to outlaw that kind of undercover videotaping and so forth? I do not. Okay. I, I'm aware of the problem and uh, I'm uh, aware of the issue of you know, how we raise our veal in little cages where the animals don't move, uh, how we raise our chickens and eggs mm -hmm. in cages and things like that. And uh, one of the cases I handled through the ACLU a few years ago was a young man who was protesting Colonel Sanders because of how they treat their chickens. And that was a fun case. It was a worthwhile case. Now. Uh, people with a different point of view wouldn't think so. Mm -hmm. Why should you abuse a local restaurant by handing out pamphlets saying Colonel Sanders tortures his chickens? Yeah. Uh, but but I, I really, I think it's an issue we should be aware of, where our food comes from, mm -hmm. and uh, are there some ethical duties to, uh, to the animals and of course now most of our fish comes from farms uh, more and more it's an impersonal factory approach mm -hmm. yeah the whole issue of factory farming is right. is really disgusting um, it, it, I don't know how much time we have left here but I think we've got a, a fair amount of time to talk about some of these things and I'll, I'll just say when it comes to ag gag you know this show goes out on YouTube so if you do happen to live in a state where an ag gag law is before the legislature or the Congress or whatever the case may be, um, you know, write to your, your lawmakers and if you care about animals, tell them that you do not want those laws passed, that you feel that, you know, atrocities being committed against animals should be exposed uh, for the rights of the animals. Um, no one needs to do those things to animals. I don't care what your position is or how big of a factory farm you may be. Um, what else is on your little list there? You brought a list in of things that you wanted to talk about. One of them was f something called fracking. Well, fracking is a major industry in the state of Wisconsin. We happen to have, more than any other state, a natural sand that can be taken out of our soil and it can be shipped to states and countries that are trying to get natural gas, trying to get oil out of the soil, mixing it with some chemicals and forcing it down into the rock. It, it expands the cracks in the rock and allows more natural gas to come out, more oil to come out, uh, and it's wonderful in that it works. At the same time, many people who have the environmentalist bent didn't want it to be done, that is the mining, uh, without some precautions because this sand 
uh, gets into the atmosphere, it gets into the cars, it gets into the windows, and the communities that have these uh, fracking mines uh, are a little bit like the cities where they used to mine asbestos. And nobody's been doing it long enough to know exactly what it does to you. And so that's one of the issues. And the state legislature tried to prohibit local governments from setting rules, standards, or prohibiting it. It's, it's a major, major industry, interestingly. It's taken a little bit of a kick because the price of oil has gone down and now some of the marginal wells are uh, not active. Sure. Well, and, and just on the subject of the price of oil going down, now, of course, they want to raise the gasoline tax, <laughs> not just in Wisconsin, but sure. in other states as well, probably most of them, uh, to make up for what they're losing at the pump. You know, so no matter which way you slice it, and, and I talked with Gordon Hintz a little bit about this this last weekend, and, you know, he said, well, you have to raise revenue somehow, you know, because otherwise we're going to have mm -hmm. to make even more cuts. I get that. But it just seems like the consumer cannot get a break no matter what. You know, how long has it been since we've seen gasoline at the pump this low, you know, below $2 a gallon? And now we're probably going to have to pay for it in another way. We, we can't, we can't no. get a break here, George. <laughs> <laughs> well, something else that I think is interesting, being that I have family in Minnesota, I graduated from the University of Minnesota, then I have family in Wisconsin. I also graduated from one of the Wisconsin schools. But uh, comparisons between Minnesota and Wisconsin are interesting because we have almost identical populations. And uh, we have a situation where things have gone in opposite directions. And they've gone in opposite directions because of redistricting. Okay. You can manipulate elections through redistricting, and in fairness, when the Democrats were in, they could have fixed it, and they didn't because they liked what it did for them. Now the Republicans are in, and uh, they don't want to fix it because it, it allowed them to get control of the, the, uh, uh, the elections that were Im important to them. But uh, with about identical, within one-tenth of a percent, Minnesotans and Wisconsin people tend to be a little bit liberal. Within one-tenth of a percent, they each voted in Obama in the last couple of elections, uh, almost identical. Yet at the same time, because of redistricting, Minnesota is a liberal state right now, and Wisconsin has gone to uh, probably the most conservative uh, state in the Midwest, with big differences in what has happened. Uh, in Minnesota, first of all, growth. They are growing a lot faster than Wisconsin. New jobs and that sort of thing. Uh, secondly, Obamacare. They took the program to get federal money. Wisconsin is uh, costing itself $100 million a year. Scott Walker cost us that. <laughs> that Walker cost us, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and the... Uh, the difference is that people in Minnesota are paying for their health insurance probably less than they were paying before Obamacare, whereas people in Wisconsin are complaining this Obamacare is killing us. Well, mm -hmm. it, it was a decision made by your particular state. Now, in fairness, Minnesota raised taxes. Walker reduced taxes, at least for some people and mm -hmm. for, uh, for corporations. But it's, it's interesting how it's gone totally one way in one state, yeah. the other way in another state, and yet the makeup of the electorate is almost identical. And of course, now we get to something that's important to me, and that is uh, we have twice as many people in prison in Wisconsin as we do in Minnesota. And it seems to cost as much to have somebody in prison as to have them in a five-star college. Mm -hmm. yep. So those are just things that people should think about. Sure. Um, and, and on that subject um, of, of prison population, 
and trying to reduce it, I recently had on, I'm sure that you're familiar with the 11 by 15 project. Um, I, I had um, two Catholic nuns on and uh, another colleague of theirs uh, probably about a month ago. And they are working with a lot of ecumenical communities to try and reduce the prison population in Wisconsin um, by sometime this year down to 11, or by 11,000 or sure. down to 11,000 or I can't remember. But, um, you know, and they brought up the comparison of here and Minnesota's prison population. So I, I know what you're saying is absolutely correct. You know, when you talk about those comparisons and the makeup of the, the assembly and, you know, the, the Congress, why can't our people here, our lawmakers here, take a look at our neighboring state and say, geez, you know, um, it's working pretty well next door why don't we try and do some of those things here? I mean, if, if Governor Walker wants us to have increased business, increased jobs, why would they not want to do that? I don't understand this. Well, he has a different, a different view uh, as to where wealth begins. Mm -hmm. There are many people who think wealth begins with the labor. There are other people who think it's the trickle-down theory of uh, wealth. Uh, Governor Romney, not the most recent one, but his dad was famous when he was running for president saying, what's good for General Motors is <laughs> good for America. And I can't say that that's necessarily untrue, but it's, it's the point of view as to where wealth starts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Um, I'm not sure how much time we actually have left here, but I, I did want to talk about, about one thing, and I understand this is still being litigated, and so you really can't discuss this a whole lot, but um, I, I'm sure that viewers out there are saying, well, you know, ask him about his own legal troubles. Um, you had some legal troubles in the last year or two, um, and it has to do with taxes, so why don't you tell folks what you can, what the government is, because this is a federal case, right? That's right. Okay. Um, why don't you share with folks what you can and what you're doing about it, because you are fighting this for sure. Oh, absolutely, I'm fighting it. At the same time, I, I want to begin by uh, saying that this problem that I'm facing in the federal court system could not have happened had I been paying attention. So the, the fault or a lot of the fault falls on me. The federal government is uh, uh, trying to teach me a lesson. They have uh, a case against me charging me with misdemeanors of willfully failing to pay income taxes in three specific years, I think 09, uh, no, 07, 08, 09. Uh, and, um, uh, I contend that I am innocent of that, uh, that I uh, not only did pay taxes, uh, for example, in the first of those years, I paid a check for $167,000, but they didn't apply it in that year. Uh, and um, uh, the jury, and I believe in juries, in uh, federal court in Green Bay found that I was guilty of willfully not paying taxes those three years. Uh, there were some legal issues about the evidence. The trial judge, uh, Judge Griesbach, acknowledged that there were legal issues. He had reversed his decision on something pretty important. So it's on appeal to the Seventh Circuit in Chicago. And uh, went down there with my wife Suzette right before Christmas and we heard the arguments by outstanding lawyers, one on my side and one on the other side. And, you know, basically uh, my lawyer, uh, I thought, did a good job. He pointed out that actually I not only had paid taxes in those years, over the past 16 years, I owed something like a million seven or a million eight, and I had really paid a million nine something, almost two million dollars. But uh, the the very able lawyer on the other side, uh, who makes a living in these tax cases, uh, uh, Matt Jacobs, said, 
okay, but he didn't pay on time. He paid other people, for example, his employees, uh, and his employees' health insurance, and uh, before he paid these taxes, and so we've added on penalties and interest, so he still owes us a lot of money. They were both right. Uh, I, uh, I will fight as long as I can. I didn't willfully not pay taxes. Uh, I believe in this country. I don't chisel on my taxes. Nobody claimed they were dishonest. Uh, but um, I owe money because I, I didn't pay the government first. And the government's in the business of teaching people a lesson. <laughs> and that's what they're trying to do. Yeah. And so far, they're doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're hanging in there. And, oh, uh, and, and your business, you oh, said, yeah. is, is no, no, my, just my, continues my to My family build. and I apologize to them and my clients uh, uh, have been wonderful. Uh, they, uh, have, they have been loyal. They appreciate that uh, I, I fight for them and they're helping me with my fight. Sure, sure. Now, um, so it's, it's in the Court of Appeals right now. Correct. How long does something like that normally take, George? I mean, how long could this go on? It might be six months before we get a decision. Okay. Okay. And then it depends on what the decision is. Sure, because you'll much appeal longer it again, take. right? You know, fortunately, <laughs> I'm a young man. <laughs> um, I want to talk in our last probably uh, five to eight minutes about, oh, you know what? There's one thing I do want to ask you, and maybe you know the answer to this, maybe you don't. A waitress in a restaurant, um, th there were a, a number of us there, and, you know, I'm accustomed to if there's more than eight usually that they automatically put the gratuity on there and there there wasn't I noticed that when the bill came and I asked her about that and she said oh we can't do that anymore it's illegal well I hadn't heard that and yet some other restaurants still do do that do you know is that illegal or can they still put a gratuity on there automatically Honest answer, I don't know, okay. but I have been with groups fairly recently where they did it, and uh, I, I was troubled because they only put on a 15%, and I usually tip 20 to 25%. Good man. <laughs> as long as the service is right. I mean, right. that's kind yeah. of always been yeah. my, my gripe with that whole thing is, you know, if you automatically tack on 18% or whatever the case sure. is, you know, they can, they can effectively get by with mm -hmm. slipshod service. Right. I don't think that most restaurants around here anyway do that. I think they're all very hardworking people for the most part. And, and I, too, usually tip higher than 18% than or 15%. But I just thought that that was interesting, and I'm not sure where she no, would have I'm, gotten I'm, that information. I'm, this is the first I've heard of that. Okay. Maybe it was just her own business then, and she just misunderstood. Um, so let's talk in our remaining minutes about your shows. You've got two shows, and how long have you been doing them? One's on environment and one's on the law. Yes. I would guess uh, 10 or 11 years. Okay. And um, they're local shows, uh, and they're also on the Internet, uh, like your show is, so that uh, every once in a while I get a call from somebody in New Jersey that says, hey, I just saw my classmate on your show or something <laughs> like that. And so uh, with modern technology, it gets a little more exposure. Mm -hmm. I am, like you are, happy to have people as guests who uh, I agree with, or better yet, don't agree with. Uh, one of my favorite guests uh, was Senator Mike Ellis while he was in the legislature. Oh, sure. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, during many years where uh, Mike uh, was recognized as a very, very effective Republican, and during some of those years I uh, carried a card of being a Democrat, but I just loved having him on because he was so forthright and he would be in your face. You, uh, and at the same time, I thought he was a great legislator because he was independent. Mm -hmm. He really did what he thought was best for the uh, district that he represented, whether uh, uh, it was the party line or not. For example, election reform. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, for a, another example, standing up for public education in spite of all of this voucher stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I thought he was an amazing legislator. He just got tired of the game as it was going on and didn't run again. And I think we're going to miss him. Yeah, absolutely. Your other show is um, 
on the environment. Correct. And have you been doing that also as long as the law show? Yes. So you started them at the same time? Well, I started the environment uh, maybe a year later. The producer at that time was a great uh, Packer fan, and he wanted every show, he, he wanted it to be a sports show. And I finally said, look, there are so many Packer programs on that I, I couldn't even uh, g compete with them, wouldn't want to compete with them. There are too many of them. I will do the show if I can talk about something I do care about, which is the environment. And so I would guess I have about nine years in. Okay, all right. And uh, in those shows, you want to give a plug for the name? Sure, it's your environment. And? It's your law. <laughs> <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> and they can both be seen here on cable access channel two um are you on do you have yours going on the radio too or no i at the moment i do not i've okay. i've gone through a different stints of that and i intend to get back on the the radio before the year's out okay excellent um just you know as we close out here what laws do you think are on the books right now that are just absurd the wackiest law that you can think of immunities everybody who has a lobby gets an immunity people don't understand that most of the people who own property or do things that cause injury to other people are immune because they've had a great lobby equine immunity do you realize that almost anything that's connected to a horse, and horses are dumb and they're dangerous. I love them, but they're dumb and dangerous and they cause a lot of injuries. The owner of that horse, or even the person who's riding that horse, is immune. Caps. Uh, it isn't just horses. Uh, there's a Good Samaritan immunity. There's a uh, school immunity. There's uh, recreational immunity. There's immunity f for almost everything. Caps, artificial caps on your liability. For example, if you were killed by a uh, grader type machine that the county of Winnebago has that goes 70 miles an hour on the highway, it's subject to a cap so that even though you should have a million dollar case, you get 50 grand max. That just recently changed, didn't it? Like in the, the last maybe, oh, five to 10 years? Well, there are caps on med mal that have changed. There, there are caps okay. on, the, uh, if you're run over by a volunteer fireman for a certain size municipality, the cap is 25 grand. Mm -hmm. So everybody who has a, a lobby gets a chance to be treated more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> we're going to have to wrap things up uh, as we're out of time. But thanks again so much for coming on, especially with just a few hours' notice. And uh, I hope our other guest um, that we were supposed to have is, is feeling better very soon. So thanks again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Keep up the great work. And good work. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. And I'll have you on again. That's going to do it for us. We will see you next time. Until then, Take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh. All right. Thank you.